So we're going to continue how to read your Bible. Part two, there are note-taking sheets. If you don't have one, raise your hand. We'll have some of the leaders to ask them the note-taking sheets out. And just remember for your, your binders and your, your sheets to help you take notes during the week, during your quiet time. Those questions, um, the daily quiet time note-taking sheets, they're in the back. So it's two pages per week. You can pick those up on your way out. To remind you, every week we will have the note-taking sheet for the message as well as your quiet questions on the back in front of the Q&A box. So we're going to talk about how to read the Bible. How do you read the Bible? And this is important. We talked last night about you to read the Bible with faith. You can't read it rightly without the Holy Spirit removing the veil, without a changed heart. But the reality is we have to actually sit in a chair. We have to look at the Word with your eyes. You have to listen to a sermon with your ears. You have to observe what's in the text. God's word doesn't change your heart like the words abracadabra, do like a, a magic spell, or bippity boppity boo, or any of the other magic words that have power. They're meaningless sounds. God's word changes your heart as it goes into your ears, or through your eyes, to your mind, and you understand it. And then it doesn't do much, but just stays in your mind. Right? We, we learned you don't have to be born again to understand the grammar or the meaning of John 3.16. You have to be a new creature to believe it. But it's not going to get to your heart so you can believe, obey, and trust God except through paying attention, through actually sitting down, keeping your bottom in the chair, your eyes on the page, reading the words and understanding and so next week, probably the week after, we're going to be going through, how do you actually do that? What are some tips? What are some, some helps for observing the text, for interpreting it? But before we jump into that, I know I keep saying, I can't wait to do that, but I keep saying there has to be one more thing we do. Before you can read the Bible well, you have to know what the Bible is. The Bible is different than any other book. Lots of books can change the way you think, right? Lots of books can give you information, change the way you see the world, the way that you think about the world, maybe the amount of what you know. There's only one book that can change your very nature. There's only one book that can change your heart, that can change your relationship with God and change your eternity. And that's God's word. God's word has power because of what it is. So we have to start by recognizing what is God's word. I know you guys, some of you might know this, some of you might not. God's word, the Bible, has 66 books in it. It was written by about 40 men over more than 1,500 years. You have the Old Testament written before Jesus, New Testament written after about Jesus and, and the church. There were 40, there were more than 40 men that wrote this over 1,500 years. And yet, the book, the Bible is one book, one complete book with one author, one divine author. The Bible says of itself that it is God's inspired words, God's self-revelation. <laughs> So each book of the Bible, as you read, will have the characteristics of the person who wrote it and lie in the context in which it was written and yet be true in every single word because it was inspired by God. So that's where we're going to start. We're going to start with this doctrine of inspiration, that every word in the Bible is inspired. What does that mean? 
think a better word is actually expired, but that sounds weird. So we, we get that from the verse 2 Timothy 3.16. We're going to have tons of Bible verses today. We're not going to have time to dig into all of them, so we're going to go fast. But you might want to write down the reference. And we are going to soon be diving into the Q&A box. So if I say something that doesn't make sense, or if you're like, I want to believe that how, or any question that pops in your mind, put it in the Q&A box. I anticipate there's going to be lots of questions about God's Word. Let's read what God's Word says about itself. It says, all scripture. Is there any scripture that's not included in that statement? All scripture is breathed out by God. And profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. What I want you to focus on is what the Bible says about itself, and it's breathed out by God. That, that word, refer, it's, it's where we get the word inspired, but inspired is breathing in. It's actually God breathed out. You know when you talk, you breathe out when you talk? Every word, even though it was people writing it, every single word was not only as if God breathed it out and said it, but it's that God actually said those words. This doesn't mean that God, like, took over the person like an avatar, like he got inside of him and he wrote the words for him, but the person didn't do it. No, when Peter wrote, Peter wrote. God wrote. When Paul wrote, Paul wrote, and it was God. Same for every other author. And we see that Peter himself, as he's writing the scripture, talks about what's happening. He says, for no prophecy of scripture was ever produced by the will of man. And yet every man when he sat down said, you know what, I want to write a, I want to write a book. We read this morning Paul's letter to Philemon. Paul sat down. There was an actual Onesimus and there was a Paul and there's a reason to write. And he says, I'm going to write a letter to Philemon. Paul wanted to write, but Paul's will wasn't ultimate. God's will was ultimate. So no prophecy of scripture was ever produced merely by the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the writing retains the, uh, the personal characteristics of the one who wrote. Paul sounds different than John, sounds different than Peter, sounds different than Isaiah, who sounds different than Ezekiel, right? Every one of the authors has their own characteristics, but they didn't write their own words merely, even though they are their words. Jesus says, how did you read in Moses? And yet, when Jesus quotes Moses, it can be said, didn't God say? This happens all over scripture, where you can say, Isaiah wrote, and God said. And it's speaking of the same words. And it wasn't like God went up to Luke and said, all right, Luke, listen up, write fast and he dictated those words to him. There were times when God did dictate, like in Exodus 34, 27, he said to Moses, write these words. Or in Revelation 2, we learned that, we heard that from, from Pastor Smed. Remember, Jesus said, write down these words to the churches. He told them these exact words. That happened sometimes. But most of the time, as God's words were breathed out into scripture, did it this way. The men were, as they, as they said, as they spoke, they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So that the words are, it has dual authorship. When Paul wrote, it was Paul's words, but it was also God's words. And you can actually see that. We're not making this up. This is what Paul said about himself in 1 Thessalonians 2. He said, and we thank God constantly for this that when you received the word of God, which we heard from us. So they come, Paul talks, Paul preaches. Now Paul's sending them a letter. You accepted it, not as the words of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. And you see that word of God spoken by men, it was at work in the believers. God's word 
every word of it in scripture is God's very words. There's no words of scripture that don't fall under that category. Does that make sense? Every single word in the Bible, in the autographic manuscripts, meaning in, in the text that was originally written by the original authors, the original recipients, was inspired, is inspired. It's interesting, Jesus refers to the words of Moses, the words of Psalms, and the words of prophets as God's word. In Matthew 4, when he was tempted, he said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Do you know what he said next? That comes from the mouth of God. So he's being tempted by Satan. And he goes, I can't do what you ask, Satan. Because it was it is written. So he refers to an authority. The very word of God incarnate refers to an authority, the word of God, that says it's written, don't man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And he was referring to the written words written by prophets, the Psalms, by Moses. In Hebrews 3, 7, the Holy Spirit, it says, the Holy Spirit says, and it quotes Psalm 95. In Acts 1.16, Peter says, Scripture had to be fulfilled. He's talking about Judas. Why did Judas betray Jesus? He says, because Scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand. And then he quotes Psalm 41. You see, this is consistent. I could keep going. We could preach a whole message, or a whole, we could do a whole camp on each one of these points. I'm going to have to move on, but I just want you to know we, I'm not telling you that every word of God's, every word in the Bible is God's word based on my authority. I'm doing it based on God's authority. God himself says this in his breathed out word. So the next thing that comes from that, you have to recognize if every word in the Bible is inspired or expired, breathed out by God, then every word is infallible. That's a big word. Does anybody here know what infallible means? Ellie, you cheated. You saw that. <laughs> what, do, what do you think infallible means? Not failable. Not infallible. Not failable. Perfect. That's the best answer of the day. <laughs> True. Without, without, um, without, it's a pull of truth. I, I can't even worry about it. Without lie. Without lie. That's actually that's actually going to be the next point, but it flows from this point. Oh, so inerrant is the next one. But infallible, it means unfailable. Oh yeah. I like it. Well, We're just going to go with unfailable. Infallible means unfailable, unable to fail, unable to be wrong. So, have you guys ever? Have you guys ever gotten the perfect score on the test? No. <laughs> yeah, I, I see some nods. There's probably a few people saying, I wish I've had the perfect score on the test. On that test, if you've done a spelling test, you've got to you can say that your spelling test, in that test, you are inerrant. You are perfect on that spelling test. But you are not infallible. You do enough spelling tests, you will fail. And you live life. You will fail. There's some books that might be close to inerrant. Like, get a math book with just addition problems. I think that's probably going to be our closest bet to just inerrant, meaning without something wrong in it. But no book except for the Bible is unable to fail or unable to be wrong. And why is this? This is because the Bible is inspired. If God breathed every word out, it cannot. You can, you can, you must trust every word in God's word because it's infallible, because it's inspired. How do I know that? Well, Hebrews 6.18, and we can just do slide after slide after slide, but we need to move on. So Ephesians 6.18 <coughs> says it is impossible for God to lie. If every word of scripture is God's word, 
It is impossible. It is unfailable. Every word of scripture will come to pass. John 10, 35, Jesus said, scripture cannot be broken. Joshua 21, 45, speaking of God made some promises, and all the promises that were meant to be fulfilled in that time were. Not one word of all the good promises that Yahweh had made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. I love this one from Isaiah. Isaiah 55. Just like, for as the rain and snow come down from heaven, and they, don't re they do not return there, but they water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, and be seed the sower, ready to eat so basically, just, just like water comes down and it, right, it rains and it goes out and waters the ground, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. Right? It doesn't rain and go right back up. It rains and the water goes out and accomplishes things. God's word does the same thing. It goes out from his mouth and it accomplishes God's purpose. But look, God's word shall accomplish that which he heard and shall succeed in the thing for which he sent it. It will not fail. Everything that God intends his word to do will happen. Because it is God's word, it cannot be wrong. Because God cannot lie. So now we get to Khalil's point. It doesn't have any error. It has only truth in it. Right? It is inerrant. So inerrant just means it. We know that God's word is inerrant. That means without error. Infallible means it is unfailable. I love that definition. I'm going to use it for the rest of my life. <laughs> inerrant, it cannot err. There is no, there's no falsehood. There is only truth in the Bible. And when we say that, we say in the original manuscripts, meaning as the authors wrote, we know that every word that they wrote was as if God it out, and then as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, every word that Paul wrote was God's word, every word was true. Every word we read in the history of God's word is true because it's God's word. And you might sometimes read in your Bible, the earliest manuscripts don't have this verse. But have you ever seen that? There's, there's some, sometimes a few small questions about was this verse or this word in the original manuscript? I want you to know you can trust God's word. When you see that, that shouldn't make you doubt it. That should make you trust it even more. Because what happened, God's words were written down thousands of years ago. And they didn't have photocopiers. Right? So think about the job. They had faithful scribes writing every word, making copies. And they made copies. And they made copies. And sometimes one copy has a little word different or a little section missing. And you might wonder, well, or a number written wrong or something like that. And you might wonder, well, should can I trust God's word now? When we say it's in the air, we're referring to the original as it was written. I want you to know we have very, very, very good copies. And none of the questions that we talk about, none of those affect any of the, the key doctrines in Scripture your Bible tells you where the problems are. You're like, oh, it's the last part of Mark supposed to be there. Or the story of the woman caught in adultery. Or maybe a verse or a word here or there. That shouldn't make you wonder, oh, can I trust my Bible? It should give you confidence that God sustains his word. And we can talk about that. Smedley did an equipping hour on that a couple years ago. If you have questions, can I trust my Bible? He did a great job. We can address that in some in a, a q and a but i want you to know yes you can and that when you read in your bible you're like, shoot was that verse actually there was that part there it's very few and your bible will tell you which ones those are i also want you to know that when we say that the bible doesn't have errors it means that what the bible actually intended to communicate was true when God when it says that God created in six days, he actually did. When it says that Israel fought and won a battle, or they fought and lost a battle, or a certain king, King David, right? King David fought Goliath, actually killed Goliath. Goliath was 
super tall, super tall guy, David killed him with a stone. That really happened. The Bible is true and you can trust it. And when the Bible tells you that there's only one way to be saved, you can trust it. But what about like when it says in Mark 1.33, that evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick and the whole city was gathered together at the door. Does that mean that if there was one guy who didn't show up at the door, well, our doctrine of inerrancy needs to come to the door? No, it, it doesn't mean that because it, it, we use language like that, right? Like when you say everyone came to the party, not every single person came to the party, or, or if it said, if it says in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Right? That just, it, it doesn't mean that you have every single thing that you want. But it's it communicating what the Bible meant to communicate. Have you ever said, oh, you scared me to death? I'm like, you liar, you're not dead. Right, you, you use <laughs> words like that. Or if you say, man, I, I'm having a party and everybody came. But I didn't come, so you're a liar. <laughs> right? Or um, he let the cat out of the bag. Or I'm all ears. He's got a big head. Right, you know each one of those things that means something different than the literal meaning. And that doesn't mean that you're lying when you say it. And so when God says um, that Jesus fed the 5,000, and what if there were 5,102? Right, there's, there's round numbers. Or in Ecclesiastes when it says the, the sun rises and the sun sets, we use that kind of language and we know that. That it just looks like that to us. That's no challenge to inerrancy. But we know that the Bible is inerrant, meaning it's without error because it's God's word and it's unable to have false falsehood. In John, Jesus said to God, he was praying, he said, your word is true. Numbers 23, 19. This is a great verse to memorize. God is not man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? Maybe that should be under infallibility, but it's, it's that God doesn't lie. Every single word is true. Psalm 119 says, the sum of your word is truth. So altogether, your word is truth, and you add it all up, nothing but truth. And every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Psalm 19.7, the law of Yahweh is perfect. It's in Proverbs 30, verse 5, every word of God is true. What was that last song's reference? Psalm 119, not 199. Not 160. And is it 160? You're right. I'm going to go with, I think it's 130. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Oh, it's, 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 like it's, 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 it's 160. It's 160. It's 160. Thank you. Fix that. There is no Psalm 199. I'm lost in trivia. But what I, what I want you to know is that. God's written word, you can trust it to be true to the same degree as if God spoke words to you and you're hearing them. If God came and he spoke and he said words, you should trust them, right? God cannot lie. You know, when you have God's word open on your lap, these are God's words. Don't try and don't say, man, I wish I had an audible word from God. I wish God would speak to me in a voice. When you say that and you neglect God's written word on your lap, you're like, remember the rich man saying, oh, if, if somebody would just rise from the dead. If you don't believe God's words written, you wouldn't believe God's words spoken because they are the same words with the same power, with the same truth. And they have the same authority. The Bible is free from error 
in doctrine, but also in history, moral instruction, in every single thing that it says. You might hear some people say God's word contains truth. Or God, the Bible contains God's words. If you hear somebody say that, put your radar up. Say, I'm not sure if I should trust you. Because that's true. Does God's word contain truth? And does God's word, does the Bible contain truth? Does the Bible contain God's words? Yes. But the Bible is only truth. And the Bible is only God's word. There is no falsehood mixed into it. And you're going to hear a lot of good people in the world who want to teach. There's some truth. There's some falsehood in there, too. But you know what that does? If that were to be true, and it's not. But then you know what our job would be? Our job would be to study really hard and figure out what's true. And if you did that, who's ultimately in charge? You are. Um, who's the guy who wrote the Declaration of Independence? John Adams. John Adams. Here's a lot of wrong answers. <laughs> John, John Adams. Wasn't it Thomas Jefferson? Yeah. 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 So, I actually, so he actually advised me. I'm sorry, am I infallible? So, but he had a Bible where he cut out the parts he didn't like. He kept, he kept his own Bible, so his, his favorite parts, his parts that he could trust. You might not do it that grossly, but you might be tempted at times. Oh, I don't care. I'm not sure if I can believe that part, or I don't want to submit to that part. When you're doing that, you're doing effectively a Thomas Jefferson, cut out the bad parts, keep your favorite parts, kind of um, kind of action with the Bible. You must not do that. And you can't, look, when you read the Bible, you can't say, I wonder if that's true. You shouldn't. You must not say, I'm going to study real hard. I'm going to look at science. Let's compare the Bible to science and say, all right, if the Bible lines up with science, then I know I can trust it. Because if you're doing that, what's the authority? Science and what is science really? It's just our observations of the world, our testing of hypotheses, and really when we say it about God's word, it's not really science anymore. Because science is you can have a hypothesis and you can test it to see if it's true. If you're saying all of the world, all of creation, all of I guess you wouldn't say creation, everything that lived evolved out of single cell organisms. That's what science. Can science test that hypothesis? No. To say the whole world, the whole universe came from the Big Bang 14.7 billion years ago. Then came down? 13.7. So whatever they're saying it is nowadays, I thought it was 14.7, but whatever they're saying it is, science can't test that. And even if it could, what it's doing in that case is you're saying, well, God said, and here's what some smart people is they look at the world with their senses and they interpreted that data. But what did that data pass through? Their heart on their way to the mind? And what does the Bible say that we do with our observations? We suppress the truth of unrighteousness. So you have a whole bunch of people who are fundamentally opposed to God saying, I'm going to come up with this thing, call it science. I'm not anti-science. I love science. They're going to say, hey, I have this system. I'm going to call it science, even though it's not. And I'm going to say God's word isn't true, because it doesn't match. That can't be the way that you come at it. You say God's word is true, because it's God's word. I'm not going to judge it. I'm not going to let some outside system judge it. I'm going to believe it. This is why when you come to God's word, you say, God, I want to see what's there. I want to understand it. And God, break my heart and make me believe it. If there's a command, make me obey it. If there's a promise or a statement, make me trust it. If the Bible is inspired, infallible, and inerrant, it has authority because it's God's word. You don't have authority over God's word. God's word has authority over you. And this is because it comes from God. 
When you read God's word, you don't stand in judgment over it. It stands in judgment over you. Colossians 1.16, speaking of Jesus. In the beginning, or sorry, that was Genesis. I was going to do Genesis. Ignore that. That was Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. I changed it to Colossians 1.16. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth. This is the one who is the word incarnate. The one who, when you read God's word, these are his words. By him, all things were made, whether visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him. So he has the right to say, he's equal, he has the knowledge to tell us what's true. He has the right to tell us how we should live. And what was his purpose for creating? They were created through him and for him. For him. God has the right and the authority to tell us what's true and how we should live. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. We see the same message in Romans 11. For from him, from God, through him, and to him are all things. Psalm 24, 1, the earth is Yahweh's, and the world and those who dwell in it. In Romans 13, there is no authority except God, and those who exist are established by God. So, if these are God's words, they are authoritative. Right? Remember what Jesus said when he was tempted. He, he referred to the authority of Scripture. It's written. Jesus said in his own ministry, don't think I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've come to fulfill them. Not one little dot. Not a letter from the call that was written will pass away until it's fulfilled. Scripture is necessary. You cannot know what you need to know to be saved, to honor God, to know who God is, to know God apart from Scripture. Scripture is necessary for salvation. Scripture is necessary for life in God. This is in Acts 4.12, it says there is salvation in no one else. There's no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. So what does this mean? There's only one way to God. The name of Jesus, right? Could you know that apart from the Bible? No. You can't. You can know a lot of things about God. You could know that God's powerful. You can know maybe that he's bigger than us, that he created things. The Bible actually says you know those things through what's been made. But you can't know Jesus. Romans 10.13 says something similar. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can you call on him in whom they haven't believed? And how can they believe in them, in him of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching or without the written word? No, you shouldn't listen to preaching that doesn't match. It doesn't come from God's word. There is only one place we came infallible knowledge of God. And there is only one book that can make us wise for salvation. You need the Bible. Not only do you need it, because you might say, yeah, I need the Bible, but I need a lot of other stuff, too. I need psychology. I need maybe other people. I need whatever you might say that you need. You do not need anything else for life and godliness other than that which the Bible says that you need. The Bible is sufficient. And in 2 Timothy, it says, how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings. By the way, this is Paul talking to Timothy. He didn't say, wait till you're old and then become acquainted with the, the Bible. No, from childhood he knew these things. And they are able to make you wise for salvation through Christ and Jesus, through faith in Christ Jesus. 
There's nothing else apart from God's word that can make you rise for salvation from faith in Christ Jesus. God's word is necessary. It's also sufficient. You might say, somebody might tell you, you know, you should read the Bible. But you also need, like, if you have a really bad depression, you might need professional counseling. God's word isn't sufficient for that. struggle with anxiety. I need I need meds. Well, God's, God's word is sufficient. Second Peter says his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him, and where do we get the knowledge of him? God taking the veil off of our eyes as we look at the scripture who called us to his own glory and excellence, so that through them, through those precious and great promises, you can become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sin for desire. I wish we could break that verse down. We can't. But let me tell you that what it's saying is that everything you need for this life Everything you need for this life to live it in a godly way, in a way that ends with you being God's child with him forever, is found in God's word through the help of the Holy Spirit. God's word is necessary and it's sufficient because it is God's word. Finally, God's word is clear. There's a funny word for this called perspicuity. You might hear that. It just means clear. It's, a, it's an odd word because it, it's, it just means it's able to be understood. But it, it's a really complicated one, so it's somewhat ironic. But um, <laughs> what it means is the Bible can be understood by people through the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. And that you don't need someone else to interpret it for you. For like a thousand years, Catholic Church said, you can't understand the Bible on your own. We're actually not going to let you read it. They only kept it in a language that people couldn't understand. And they said, you need us to tell you what it means. Now, it is true that you need help to understand what God's word means. And that's because the natural person Right? Apart from God's Holy Spirit, the natural person doesn't accept the things of the Spirit of God because they're falling down. He is not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. So when you read God's Word, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you might understand what the words mean, but you can't accept them. You don't understand them the way that you should because you need the Holy Spirit. But do you know what it says of Christians? But we have the mind of Christ. The reality is, God's word is written in such a way that every single person has access to it. A child can understand the gospel message. A child can understand what they need to know to be saved. But the Bible isn't simple. Right? The Bible's clear. The Bible's understandable. But it's not always simple. It's deep enough that readers of the highest intellectual ability will never exhaust the depth or knowledge of God contained there. But it's, there's nothing impossible to understand in the Bible apart from God's help. In fact, the Bible says of itself, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Meaning, if you're reading God's word, you're going to see better the way that you live. And the unfolding of your words gives light. Do you see who it imparts understanding to? The simple. And yet, it, it is hard in places. Peter, this one is a pretty interesting verse, and we're going to end here. It says, there are some things, and he's talking about 
Paul's writings. So Peter said that what Paul wrote is scripture. Because look at there. He says there's some things in Paul's writings that are hard to understand. It means you might have to work hard. You might have to think hard about these things. Paul actually says that. Think hard. And but what do some people do with the stuff that's hard to understand? Be ignorant and unstable twist them. They say, I don't want to do the hard work to understand what it actually means. I'm going to twist it to mean what I want it to mean. What happens if you do that? So don't come to God's word saying, this is too hard for me. Or, I don't want to do the hard work. I want to read this and think, yep, this, is, this says what I already think. Or, some people read the Bible and say, oh, here's what it means to me. I don't care what it meant to you. What did Paul mean when he wrote the hard words? Because that's where truth and life is going to be. That's where authority is. That's where the power is. And ignorant and unstable and false teachers, they twist them to their own destructions, destruction as they do the other scriptures. There are lots of false teachers out there that say, this is what, the God, this is what God's word says. God's word is clear enough for you to open it and say, is that really what God's word says? Right? You've heard of the Bereans who tested what was simply was taught to them against God's word. Be like that. So Peter's command, as you read Paul and the rest of scripture, is to therefore take care, be careful, and grow in grace and in knowledge. So as you read the Bible, Read it well. Right? If you're going to understand something, you actually have to do hard work to read it well. We're going to talk about what that means. We're going to talk about how to do that. But if you don't know what God's word is and why it's so important to read it well, you might not. So next week, we're going to come in and we're going to talk through this. Listening, understanding, um, the sake of belief, obedience, and trust through observation, interpretation, and application. But I want you to really, really think hard this week in the discussion groups about what God's word is and how that should affect your reading of it. If everything I said is true, you aren't going to wake up tomorrow and say, man, I can't wait to fill in the blank and let, I'm going to skip God's word because it's not that important. I don't really need it. Or you won't read it and say, I can't believe that. You're going to say, I want to open God's word because I need God's word. I need to see the God who wrote this word into his word. And you're going to pray. You're going to say, God, make me listen. Make me understand. Some of this stuff is hard. see him as he is. Do you remember what 1 John 3 said? Be made like him. So let's, uh, let's go do discussion groups. I want you guys to talk over this for about 20 minutes. Read the Bible every day this week. We'll see you back here next time. Thank you.